Medgar Evers is one of the most important civil rights activists in American history. He fought against Jim Crow, was the NAACP's first field officer in Mississippi, and spearheaded investigations into some of America's most egregious racial crimes. The murder of Medgar Evers, coming up. This is KRT, Critical Race Theory. It's not the one they teach in law school, but the one banned in public schools. In this episode, it's the murder of Medgar Evers, episode nine. Medgar was born July 2nd, 1925, in Decatur, Mississippi, to James and Jesse Evers. He was one of four children, but he formed a close bond with Charles, his older brother. James found work in a sawmill while Jesse was a laundress. Jesse and James hammered home the importance of education while Charles taught young Medgar skills such as hunting, boxing, swimming, and fishing. Medgar and his brother would walk several miles to their segregated school as they were not allowed to attend schools with white children. He once said, quote, I was born in Decatur here in Mississippi and when we were walking to school in the first grade, white kids in their school buses would throw things at us and yell filthy things. This was a mild start. If you're a kid in Mississippi, this is the elementary course. And unfortunately, he was right. Growing up in a segregated Mississippi forced Evers to witness some of the most brutal forms of racism. Evers continued, quote, I graduated pretty quickly. When I was 11 or 12, a close friend of the family got lynched. I guess he was about 40 years old, married, and we used to play with his kids. I remember the Saturday night, a bunch of white men beat him to death at the Decatur Fairgrounds because he sassed back at a white woman. They just left him dead on the ground. Everyone in town knew it, but never said a word. Hmm, I guess that's why Dion left. Megger was drafted into the army in 1943, which would make him a ripe young 18 year old at the time. He was inducted at Camp Shelby in Mississippi and fought in World War II. He was placed in a segregated portion of the Quartermaster Corps, which further exasperated him. As a technician fifth grade, he served in both England and France, but became disillusioned with the military due to the racist treatment the segregated black soldiers were subject to while fighting for their country. He was honorably discharged in 1946 and returned home to fight a war he felt was more pertinent to himself the war against systemic and institutional racism. After returning from World War II, Mecca found that he would not be treated with the same respect as white veterans back home. Mecca registered to vote, but found resistance when he and his brother tried to exercise their right. Medgar, his brother, and a handful of their friends were threatened at gunpoint by over 200 white men when attempting to vote in a local election. Often racist whites would try to intimidate blacks who went to vote and it would frequently get violent. He stated, Now for many of us who've gone overseas, fought for this country, fought for Mississippi, we fought for Alabama, we fought for North Carolina, we fought for Illinois, and we fought for every state in this union. Now we're gonna stay here and see that the things that the mayor has said become a reality. Although Medgar was blocked from voting, this only set the fire in his chest ablaze with more determination than ever. He and his brother Charles would register for the NAACP with the motivation to help disenfranchised black citizens gain proper access to voting. The NAACP had already garnered a reputation for pushing back against lynchings and other acts of racial violence, and Medgar found himself drawn to their passionate and genuine fight for equality. Medgar knew that his education would also play a huge role in helping black Americans secure better rights. So he attended the HBCU Alcorn Agricultural and Mechanical College, which is now called Alcorn State University. It was here that he met Merle Beasley and fell in love. She says, quote, we saw each other in passing at school, 
particularly at the gymnasium, which was also our food service area. One day he asked me to sit with him, saying, I just want to talk. I thought, fine, there's no harm in talking. He proceeded to tell me, and I quote, you will be the mother of my children. I was 17 years old and had barely even dated. Murley and Megger were married in 1951, and the following year after he graduated, the two would move to Philadelphia, Mississippi. Megger worked selling life insurance, but quickly became entrenched in activism. He witnessed an attempted lynching in 1954 that would further encourage him to work on securing rights for black Americans. At the time, Megger's father was very ill and in the hospital. While visiting his dad, Megger ran into a mob of angry racist white people outside. Quote, on that very night, a Negro had fought with a white man in Union, Mississippi, and a white mob had shot the Negro in the leg. Maker stated, the police brought the Negro to the hospital, but the mob was outside, armed with pistols and rifles, yelling for the Negro. I walked out into the middle of it. It seemed that this would never change. Medgar ended up becoming involved with the Regional Council of Negro Leadership in Mound Bayou, a predominantly black town that was created by former slaves. The RCNL was founded in 1951 by Theodore Roosevelt Mason Howard. He was an intelligent and wealthy businessman. The civil rights organization attracted the attention of Medgar as he worked alongside Howard in the insurance business. The RCNL staged boycotts against gas stations that banned black people. You couldn't even buy gas? Organized protest against police brutality, still got that, and also orchestrated several drives to encourage black Americans to register to vote, still have that. Working within the RCNL gave Medgar his first real experience at organizing large events in the name of civil rights. In May 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court made the landmark decision in the famous Brown v. Board of Education case. This legally desegregated schools, although the decision was on paper and the real life process of desegregation was a much bigger battle to be fought. In response to the board v. the Board of Education decision, white supremacists in the South created the White Citizens Council. It was a violent political body that would use its influence to make sure black states segregated. Megger applied to the University of Mississippi Law School. However, he was rejected because he was black. Undeterred, he would continue his work with the NAACP by filing a suit against the school. Although the lawsuit failed, he would later help another black student fight his way into the university. When Medgar and Murley moved to Jackson, Mississippi, the couple's activism took another leap forward. Mecker was appointed as the NAAC's first field officer in Mississippi in 1954. In this role, Medgar was involved in a few very high profile cases. One such case was that of James Meredith, who became the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. That's the same college that denied Medgar entry. In 1961, James applied to the University of Mississippi, and although he was at first accepted, his admission was rescinded after the school found out he was black. James filed a lawsuit for discrimination, which failed in the state courts. However, Megger was able to bring the NAACP's legal team into the battle, which was headed by Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood was the chief attorney for the plaintiffs in the Brown v. Board of Education, so he already had expertise dealing with cases of this magnitude. James's case made it all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled in his favor. But when James went back to the university to enroll in classes, he was met with blockades and riots, which left two people dead. Angry mobs of racist whites flew Confederate flags as they destroyed property and attacked anyone supporting James. Attorney General Robert Kennedy sent U.S. Marshals, while President John F. Kennedy dispatched the military to assist the deadly situation. 160 of the U.S. Marshals were wounded, 28 of them shot. Finally, the military was able to get a handle on the situation 
and James was able to enroll in 1962. Another prominent case that Megger was monumental in was the investigation into the murder of Emmett Till. In 1955, 14-year-old Emmett was visiting relatives in Mississippi and stopped in a shop along with his cousins. A white woman, Carolyn Bryant, claimed that Emmett whistled at her, grabbed her, and was sexually menacing. Several decades later, Bryant would admit that she lied about the whole thing. However, at the time, she stuck with her story. Her husband, Roy Bryant, and brother-in-law, J.W. Malam, abducted, tortured, and murdered Emmett. They tied a 75-pound cotton gin fan around his neck and tossed him into a river. His body was recovered, bloated, and beaten, and his mother, Mamie Elizabeth Till Mobley, held an open casket funeral to alert the world to the brutality of racism in the South. Megger opened an investigation into the murder, urging any black witnesses to come forward despite the dangers they would be in by speaking out. After securing black witnesses, Medgar and T.R.M. Howard helped protect them throughout the trial, even assisting them in escaping the town after things had concluded. Despite all this work, J.W. Malam and Roy Bryant were acquitted and Howard was placed on the KKK's death list. He was forced to flee Mississippi. Maker's involvement in such high-profile cases put him in the crosshairs of the KKK. White supremacists attempted to kill him many times. His home was firebombed in May 1963 and his family was threatened on several occasions. On June 12, 1963, U.S. President John F. Kennedy, who would be assassinated only a few short months later, called the white resistance to civil rights for blacks a moral crisis and pledged his support to federal action on integration. That same night, white supremacists made good on their threats. Mecker Evers returned home just after midnight from a series of NAACP functions. As he left his car with a handful of t-shirts that read, Jim Crow must go, he was shot in the back. His wife and children who had been waiting up for him found him bleeding to death on the doorstep. Megger was often escorted home by FBI and police officers for his own safety. However, on the day of his assassination, he arrived home without the escort. This has been Critical Race Theory, Episode 9, The Murder of Megger Elvers. Thanks for checking in. Please like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and family. We'll see you next time.